In the 15th year after the Prophet Muhammad's migration from Mecca to Medina, 636 in our calendar, the armies of the Rashidun Caliphate stood victorious against the Sassanid and Eastern Roman empires, but these empires were still resisting. The second season of this series will describe the war in Iran, Turkey, Egypt, Northern Africa and beyond, as the Muslim armies gear up for more conquest. Welcome to our second season of videos on the early Muslim expansion, which was crucial in the creation of the modern world. We're excited to present the sponsor of this video, Displate. Displate makes high quality handcrafted metal posters designed by talented artists. The print quality, designs and even the packaging of these easily mountable magnet posters are awesome and the company is environmentally conscious, planting one tree for each purchase Displate. There are more than 800,000 designs available. History, sports, comic, movies, nature, manga, you name it. Displate delivers your order in a matter of days, and each Displate is printed on demand and signed by the master of production. Our fans will surely enjoy the Displate collections like Warriors of the Ages, Knights and Warriors, Antic Roman Age, Heraldry, Armor, and our favorite, War and Battles, which features Displates with the art of the American Revolution and Civil War. We started adding our own designs from our art and our viewers will be able to buy them too. Support our channel and make your home more representative of your taste and interests by buying displates via the link in the description. There is a special discount available for our viewers. You can buy a displate for 30% off during the first week and then for 20% off by clicking our link. In the previous season, we covered the first stages of the Muslim conquest of the Middle East. It started in 633 with the campaign in Mesopotamia against the Sassanid Empire, led by the general of the Rashidun Caliphate, Khalid ibn al-Walid. After a string of victories that brought him to the border of the Eastern Roman Empire, Khalid entered Syria and again won a number of decisive battles, culminating at the Battle of Yarmouk, which put most of the region under the control of the Caliphate. In southern Mesopotamia, though, the Sassanid Empire attempted a counterattack, which led to the Battle of al qadisiyah After the battle that continued for days, the Muslim army, commanded by Sa'id ibn Abi Waqqas, defeated Rostam's Sassanid force. Amidst the slaughter and unfolding catastrophe at qadisiyah the commander of the Persian center-right, Jalinus, assumed leadership of the imperial army's remnant and set about saving what forces he could. Assembling a small elite strike force, he thrust towards the al Dam and drove a unit of Muslim troops away before forming a perimeter and holding it. As Sassanid stragglers withdrew across the dam wall to the other side, Jalinus bravely repelled many attacks from the Muslims and managed to see most of the remaining troops to safety, but it was still a painfully small number. When the last of them were on the canal's far side, Jalinus had the dam destroyed and began hastily pulling his men upstream to Najaf before the victors fully turned on him. Unwilling, however, to give the foe any breathing room, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas dispatched Kaka and Shirabil to hunt down scattered Persian units, while cavalry commander Zura bin al hawiya was sent after Jalinus with 300 elite Arab horsemen. Not deterred by the dam crossing's destruction, Zura and his 300 drove their mounts into the torrent and forded it before chasing Jalinus's column upstream. The latter realized he was being chased and halted with his own cavalry at a nearby bridge, while the infantry carried on withdrawing all the way to Najaf. After a short time, the horsemen of Zura came across Jalinus's valiant rearguard and charged it breaking the formation swiftly and provoking its leader into yet another withdrawal. His heels constantly bit by Zura as he did, Jalinus chose to turn and face the enemy in a final fight, believing that the best way to stop the pursuit was to kill the leader. So, he halted his forces, turned about face and arrayed for battle, before personally riding before his troops and challenging Zura to single combat. Galloping forward atop their horses, the two exhausted commanders fought one another to decide the issue once and for all. And once again it was the Muslim who came out on top after a hard-fought struggle. 
Jalinus was killed and his cavalry took flight, but many were still caught and slain by Zura's riders. By sunset, the 300 reached Najaf where they halted for the night. With the aim of conquering prosperous Iraq, which the Muslims believed was the heart of the world, Sa'd reorganized his 20,000 troops into five marching corps, with Zura retaining his advance guard position. Two weeks after Qadissia, he was quickly joined at Najaf by the remainder of the army and given the order to cross the Euphrates. Incoming Sassanid reinforcements under Nakirjan arrived in the area soon after, having been initially bound for Rostam's now broken force. Hearing of the defeat, the reinforcement group halted east of the Euphrates and waited for new orders from Tessiphon, which came in the form of Firzan, a general tasked by Emperor Yazdegerd with preventing or delaying the seemingly unstoppable advance of the Muslims. When Firzan appraised the situation, he decided that his army of fresh and recently defeated forces under his command wouldn't be enough to throw the Arabs back. So he instead prepared defensive actions at a series of defensible locations and cities on the road to the Persian capital, so that the great city would have time to fortify. As his first move, Firzan ordered the governor of Burz, Busbura, to hold his branch of the Euphrates and gave him some troops to help with the task, while the general and his main army started massing near Babylon. When Zura's advance guard neared Burz, the city's governor rode out to meet him. In a short battle, the holding force of Sassanid troops was routed and Busbura severely wounded. During the flight, he died from his wounds. Following this defeat, the new local leader made peace with the Caliphate, agreeing to provide information and logistical assistance. From these new allies, Zura learned that the formidable main Sassanid army opposing him was indeed across the Euphrates at Babylon, along with several high nobles. Zura then forwarded this crucial information to Sa'd at Najaf and waited for the four corps trailing his own to catch up. When they did, the Muslims advanced on Babylon in strength and at some point in December 636, met Firzan along the riverbank and crushed his army in a brief but harsh battle. One of the defeated generals, Homuzan, fled south with his contingent to his domain in Awaz, while Firzan and the remainder withdrew north in good order, leaving garrisons at Sura and Dirkab along the way. Zura again set off in hot pursuit, and, despite fierce resistance from the defensive Sassanid armies in his way, managed to defeat them at Sura, Dirkab and Kusa on his relentless drive to Tesiphon. By early January of 637, the Muslim leader neared Vologesakerta, just one of the cities which made up larger Tesiphon, where he was again rejoined by the bulk of his army. To the desert-dwelling Arabs, whose largest urban centers were but a fraction of the size, the Persian capital was unlike anything most of them had ever witnessed in their lives. More than just a single city, Tezaphon had in fact grown to encompass about seven grandiose population centers which had been constructed and assimilated over the centuries, forming a true metropolis. Because of its unique nature, the Persian heartland was dubbed Madain, or the cities in Arabic. On the Tigris's western bank stood Seleucia, Vologesakerta, and Ve'adashir, while Tesiphon proper and a number of peripheral hubs were to the east. Perhaps the most majestic sight for those approaching Arabs during 637 would have been the 40-meter-tall Arch of Khosrow, an architectural marvel unique in the world at the time. Although Firzan hadn't managed to stop the Muslim advance, his delaying action had worked and now the entire western portion of Yazdegerd's imperial capital was fortified with a deep ditch with manned positions at regular intervals. The Sassanid Shah and his advisors also massed a number of ballistae and catapults in the bounds of Ve'adashir, which, as the closest subsidy to Tesiphon proper, was the focus of their defensive efforts. Zura ordered an attack on Madain shortly after his arrival, but Yazdegerd's artillery began launching bolts and throwing giant stones out of Ver'adashir and into the Muslim ranks, 
causing severe losses and forcing Zura's forces to retreat out of range. Unable to reply in kind, he sent scouting parties to probe and find a way inside, but everywhere they came across the Persians' defensive trench and were unable to breach it. Sa'ad arrived at this point and assumed command, swiftly deciding that there was little point wasting his warriors in careless assaults against such strong defences. So instead he established a blockade around all of Madain west of the Tigris and settled his forces down for a long siege. However, Sa'ad wasn't content to sit and wait for victory, taking all measures he thought possible to secure a faster surrender of the unbelievers, primarily by scything away at the western bastion's food supplies. To do this, he had his sub-commanders conduct raids on the neighbouring hinterland, seizing cattle and sheep for the Muslims' own use, whilst also sapping the enemy's resources by preventing supplies from reaching their Ardashir. In the process of doing so, Arab cavalry seized thousands of farmers as prisoners of war, who, upon the intercession of a regional leader who had submitted, were freed upon agreeing to pay the jizya tax. In addition, security for their lives and possessions were guaranteed, an act which won the Muslim invaders considerable goodwill with the locals. Throughout the month-long siege, Sa'ad's warriors had also been continuously harried by the sophisticated Sassanid engines of war Yazdegerd's generals had amassed, although casualties at their hands remained relatively light. Unfortunately for the Persians, some of their engineers defected during the course of the siege and provided their masters with at least 20 novel artillery pieces of their own. When these contraptions subsequently began sending their own missiles howling into Tesiphon, the dense concentration of Sassanid soldiers and civilians inside resulted in them causing terrible destruction. The fact that the Muslims had even acquired weaponry of this kind, which had until then been universally in Persian hands, also badly affected morale. By mid-March 637, Western Madain's situation was becoming intolerable. Persian civilians starved to death in the hundreds, while more and more were reduced to eating stray cats and dogs to survive. Beset by such conditions, the Sassanid troops not manning the ditch were concentrated into a single strike force and led in a desperate sortie beyond their defences. The Muslims arrayed to meet them in a pitched battle, and a desperate struggle began. Zura's corps was in the thick of the action, and he himself was wounded by an arrow. Despite his injury, the valiant Bani Tamin chief led a counterattack and personally slew the Persian strike force commander, after which the defenders withdrew behind their ditch. The savage fighting to repulse the Persian attack was followed by a few hours of eerie calm, during which a Sassanid officer approached the Muslims with an offer. Each belligerent would retain whatever territory they had captured on their respective sides of the Tigris. However, these conditions were declined with the reply, there can never be peace between us until we get the honey out of the lemons of Kusa. When these peace overtures were rejected, the Persian forces in Ver Ardashir quietly withdrew from their positions and pulled back across the Tigris. Western Tesiphon was now under Muslim control. Yazdegerd III also sent his family, retainers and treasury ahead to Holwan, where the emperor intended to move his court if the great capital fell. Although behaving as if defeat was already inevitable, from his seat in the White Palace, Yazdegerd appointed Rostam's brother, Kurizad, and Miran to command the defense of the eastern city. These generals promptly redeployed their remaining forces on the eastern bank and waited for the besiegers' next move. That same evening, on the river's edge of newly occupied Ver Ardashir, Sa'ad stared across the Tigris at the glorious Arch of Khosro and pondered his next move, eager to claim it for Islam. As Muhammad's former companion strategized to himself, a Persian approached him and asked, What are you waiting for? Followed by the alarming revelation that not another two days will pass before Yazdegerd departs the capital with everything in Tesiphon. Time was now of the essence. Another sympathetic local, 
possibly disillusioned by heavy Sassanid taxation, or possibly even a recent convert to Islam, took Sa'd to a known ford in the river, one which Sa'd deemed unsuitable due to the swift current and deep water. Rather than making a hasty decision right then, he chose to sleep on the issue and decide in the morning. During the night, Sa'd supposedly had a strange dream in which he saw the Tigris's waters, only they were flowing incredibly quickly and were unrealistically deep. Still, his own Arab cavalry appeared and plunged into the seemingly impassable torrent, reaching the other side relatively easily. The next morning, Sa'd convened a conference of his highest generals and declared that the cavalry would swim through the river and asked if there were any volunteers to lead the dangerous attack. The first to put himself forward was Asim bin Amr, Kaka's tribal comrade and a dashing military leader, followed by 700 of the most reckless and brave Muslim warriors. After all necessary preparations had been made by mid-morning, Asim plunged into the water and began his crossing. Kurizad responded by ordering his Persians into the river to meet them, but after a hearty resistance, the Sassanid cavalry who responded were pushed back when one of their comrades from the city came, shouting, Why are you killing yourselves? There's nobody left in Tessaphon to defend! He was at least partially correct. Upon receiving word that the Muslims were crossing the Tigris, Emperor Yazdegerd had departed his capital for Hulwan, taking much of the imperial court with him. After their resistance faltered, most of the army defending the city followed suit, save for a Sassanid regiment fortified in the White Palace. On the Tigris, Sa'd took the opportunity Asim's lance-like advance had given him and began ferrying the rest of his warriors across to the beachhead, not without danger of succumbing to the raging waters. One man fell from his horse and fell into the current, but the all-powerful Kaka reached down in the nick of time and heaved him up. Despite the myriad dangers of the crossing, in relatively short order, the entire Islamic army was on the eastern bank of the Tigris River. The moment Sa'd himself landed, he ordered Asim and Kaka to move on the core of Tessiphon, in the process of which they encountered token resistance, but this was quickly dealt with. The Muslims found their final opposition in the White Palace, but chose to deal with it by sending forward yet another companion of Muhammad, Salman. A Persian by birth, he had converted to Islam after meeting the Prophet in Arabia, and now his heritage proved a crucial boon. I am actually one of you, I feel for you, he said upon meeting the defenders, and outlined the usual three choices, jizya, conversion, or death. After a short negotiation, the hopeless palace troops accepted the Islamic tax and surrendered. Tessiphon, jewel of the Sassanid imperial superpower for over four centuries, was now in Arab hands, a people who had been a mere afterthought only years earlier. Separate columns of Arab riders under Zura and Kaka galloped forth from the captured city almost immediately, moving in different directions in pursuit of their enemy. The spoils were plenty. For example, 11 priceless suits of armor and swords which belonged to Heraclius of the Byzantine Empire, the Turkish Kagan, and other world leaders. Other treasures now in Sa'd's hands included gold, jewels, and imperial regalia. With the Sassanid capital had come the empire's boundless wealth, and also the first major mass conversions of Persians to Islam. Salman the Persian in particular played a role in this religious change, preaching to his countrymen the values and beliefs of the new faith. Although Tessiphon and all the Sawad was lost to the House of Sassan, the Persians' resistance to their conquest by the Muslims would continue in the old heartland beyond the Zagros, and more videos are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.